Good evening, good evening and welcome. Uh, just a few, a few notices before we begin. So, particular welcome this evening to Dan and Beth and Reisinger. Dan's going to be uh, preaching uh, from Revelation chapters 4 and 5 a little bit later on. Uh, so, nice to see you. Uh, Dan's also, oh, well, Dan and probably Beth and I think are coming back in two weeks' time, the 4th of February, and they're going to lead our morning uh, Bible study meeting for us then. So you'd be welcome to come then as well. Uh, two other things, both happening on Wednesday evening. Uh, our normal uh, Bible study and prayer meeting here in the back hall at 7.45, looking at the next part, the second part of the book of Ecclesiastes. And at the same time, sorry, you're going to get a mouthful of uh, letters now, the AGBCSESW district prayer meeting. So the southwest division of our section of the Association of Grace Baptists. Uh, district prayer meeting in Staines, uh, and Lance is going to uh, attend on our behalf uh, on, at that meeting. So they'll be praying for us and praying for other churches within the district. So that's the notices. Let's call our minds to worship. So this is what it says, a familiar passage, Isaiah chapter 6, the beginning. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined. From a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Let's pray. Father, as we come here this evening, we are aware that actually the church, the gathering of your people, is your temple. And as we come, we're also aware of, of who you are, that you are holy, not just holy, but holy beyond all ideas of what holiness means. And Lord, just as Isaiah experienced, we, we are not holy. Lord, we know that our mouths speak from what our hearts are full of. And Lord, as we look back on our, our words during the week that's passed, our words have not always been perfectly honest. Father, we confess we've, we've sometimes distorted the truth or we've exaggerated. We've said things which were not quite real and we've done that for our own ends, for our own purposes. And Lord, at other times we've shown a selfish anger. We've expressed that in our words, perhaps where we've demanded our own rights above the needs of others around us. But Lord, not just that we have said things like that, but we've also failed to say things that we should have said. We've held back from, some, from speaking words of, of grace and of mercy when people around us have needed it. And Lord, all of those things come or don't come from our hearts. And so Lord, perhaps this evening we also come with that, that sense that Isaiah had, woe is me. But Lord, just as he did, we also come to hear a voice which tells us that you have, you have made atonement for us through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ shed on the cross, just as that 
coal came from the altar, the altar of sacrifice, to bring cleansing. Lord, so we are cleansed by a sacrifice which is all sufficient, all sufficient to satisfy even your extreme holiness. And so, Father, we come, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for the atonement for our sins. We thank you that you have brought us to that place of being completely free from guilt and punishment. And so, Father, now as we come, as we come to meet together as a local church here in this place, Lord, please help us to come with hearts ready to hear your voice and ready to respond as I did, as Isaiah did in, in glad <coughs> obedience to what you call us to do. We pray that you be with us now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So our first, our first hymn this evening is a well-known old hymn. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. So the first verse says this. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. We bring, we bring our praise to the triune God. God the, the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That thrice holy God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Please stand and sing. Turn to the book of Revelation. Uh, so we're on page 1236. 1236 in the Church Bibles, Revelation chapter 4, and uh, beginning at verse 1. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked. 
And there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had heard, first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian. A rainbow resembling an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the centre, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and behind. The first living creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives for ever and ever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worships him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sit, sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased men for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb 
be praise and honour and glory and power for ever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. So I'm sure Dan is going to explain some of those things to us a little bit later on. But before that, uh, we're going to pray. So, please, let's all pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we come before you, we know that you are the all-powerful and all-gracious Father. That, Lord, the work that we do and the work of your people throughout the world is your work, not our work. And so, Lord, as we come, we, we know that we can bring before you all sorts of things. And, Lord, we don't, come, we don't come to advise you on what to do, but we do come as you command us to take part in your work through this work of prayer. Father, we want to pray for the work of Rocco and Maddie there in Turin. We pray for their work amongst the students, the work that Rocco does. But we also want to pray for the church planting group as it comes together over these next few months to, to just plan the way forward for the planting of that new church there in that large and needy city. Lord, please be with them and guide them. And we pray for Rocco and Maddie too, that as they continue to search for a, a more permanent place to live, that you would truly guide them to the, uh, an apartment in the right place. Lord, please be with them in that, we pray. And we also want to pray, Lord, for the, the church in Funchal in Madeira tonight. Thank you for the faithful work that is done there. And we pray for them as they meet together tonight, that, Lord, you would be with them, that you would bless your word and your work in that place. Lord, draw people to yourself and grow that church, we pray. But we also want to pray for our, our friends Chris and Kathy, who've uh, been here on a, a number of occasions. And, Lord, we pray for their upcoming trip to, to Kenya and to Zambia. We thank you that we've met recently or in a few months ago with Graham and Sally and heard about the work that they do in Kenya and we do pray that Chris and Kathy would be a, a real encouragement to them as they meet with them for a few days. But Lord, as, as Chris and Kathy go on to, to Zambia for a longer period of time, we pray for <coughs> the work that they're going to do on the OM Zambia base there pray that they would be a, an encouragement too to Dan and Ruth and to the boys. We pray that as uh, Kathy gets involved uh, with the, the Bethesda School for the Disabled, that she, her teaching there would be a great help to those who are seeking to, to show real care to people who are otherwise neglected in that country. Lord, just please be with Chris and Kathy, we pray. But Lord, as we look closer to home. We, we want to continue to remember those in our fellowship and related to us, uh, those with various health needs. We thank you for good news last week from one of our friends that we've been praying for, that her cancer seems to be much more under control and we, we do commit her to you and pray that that would continue, that you would continue to strengthen her and give her that energy and ability to, to return to work at the, at the right time. But Lord, we, we also remember others that are still going through some very difficult times. Lord, some who have been in hospital and may even still be in hospital at this moment. And we, we do pray that they would know that you are near them, that you are a God of grace and love and mercy. And we pray that they would know your comfort. The comfort that you give directly through the presence of your Holy Spirit, but also the, the comfort brought by uh, the presence and the prayers of, of faithful Christian friends. Lord, please bless them, we pray. Father, we do pray for, for hope for kids in a few minutes' time. Pray that as they study the work of the Holy Spirit, that you would give them an insight into your truth. Pray perhaps that other families with, ch with children will join us in the future. And we pray for this work amongst children and families to grow here. And we also pray as that happens that, Lord, you would bring others who would help to take on this vital work uh, in the church here. <coughs> Finally, Father, we were, we were thinking this morning of 
the church in Antioch, praying and fasting, and open to what you had to say to them about the work that you had for Paul and Barnabas to do. And so, Lord, we commit our time on Wednesday to you and the, the association meeting in Staines as well, that as your people pray, that our prayer would be characterised by, by faithfulness, that we will be fervent in prayer, but also that there will be an openness to the way in which you want to lead us and to lead your church elsewhere for the future. Lord, we commit that to you. Please may we, we know your direction and be willing to follow it and to rejoice in the fact that you have a plan and a purpose for us, which though it may at times have led through hard times, is still part of a plan which is for our good and for the progress of the gospel and the growth of your people here. Well, thank you that we can bring these things to you. We do lift them to you, not in our own name, but in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So our second song, and during this song, children can go out to Hope for Kids. Uh, so our second song is Be Thou My Vision. And the penultimate, the last but one verse, says this. I think it's a real challenge. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. Thou mine inheritance, now and always. Thou and thou only the first in my heart. High King of Heaven, my treasure thou art. So if, I, if our aim is to be people of sincerity and truth, these are words that we need to think very carefully about as we sing them. But we should sing them. But I pray that we would sing them. We'd be enabled to sing them with clean lips and to sing them from the heart. So please stand and let's sing.
Please sit down. Well, good evening, everyone. It is a joy to be with you all. Let me invite you to have Revelation chapter 4 and 5 open before you as we look at it together. But before we do that, let's pray for God to be at work among us. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, in you we find all fullness of wisdom and light. So we pray in your mercy that you would enlighten us by your Holy Spirit in the true understanding of your word and give us the grace to receive it in true fear and humility that we may learn to render to God the love and obedience which faithful servants owe their masters. Through our Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, by way of introduction, let me tell you about an article I, an article I read this week. Uh, it looked at the first time historically that followers of Jesus were called Christians. Um, interestingly, it pointed out that in Acts 11, it wasn't the church that defined themselves as Christians, but the city. The city of Antioch looked at this community of believers, their lives and their teaching, and saw that the, their defining feature was their devotion to Christ. So the city started calling them Christians. I wonder, would our friends, family, colleagues, peers do the same? Would they say the same about us? I wonder, would Hazelmere say the same about Hope Chapel? If they peered into our life together, would they see and hear that we are all about Christ? Does our life and our teaching reflect the supreme worthiness of the Lord Jesus? You know, this is not a given. There are many, even many churches, who live and breathe and act as if Jesus is not worthy to reign supreme in the throne room of their hearts. Many irreligious and religious unbelievers who lie under the power of the evil one and refuse to ascribe Jesus the honour he deserves. And it's not easy for Christians and churches to remain faithful, is it? Our world is full of theories and philosophies and values which are all contrary to Christ. Just ready to pull us away from the truth like a tide dragging us to the rocks upon which many have made shipwreck of their faith. And we're so prone to wonder, aren't we? prone to conform and to fit in and to adopt the godless ways of the society around us, inclined to stray away from biblical truth, to compromise on biblical ethics and morality, to fall asleep at the will, growing complacent and indifferent and lethargic in our faith. Like moths drawn to a flame, we are so easily drawn to the deceptive enticements of sin, drawn to give the warmth of devotion to things less deserving, drawn to lose heart at the first sign of discomfort. And if this is true of us, it was equally true uh, for the original readers of the book of Revelation for the seven churches that are addressed in chapters 1 to 3. And so, the risen Lord Jesus gives the Apostle, the Apostle John a series of visions to write down for the church, to encourage them, to spur them on to love 
and good works. Four grand visions challenging them and us to resist worldly compromise and spiritual complacency under the pressure of the culture we live in. Four grand visions to stoke the flames of our love and devotion for our great God and Saviour so that we might increasingly live up to the name Christian and be all about Christ. And this is very purposeful. So the visual power of Revelation is designed to awaken and to purify our imaginations, refurbishing them with alternative visions of how the world was and is and will one day be. As one writer expressed, it is by the imagination that men have lived and imagination rules all our lives. The human mind is not, as philosophers would have you think, a debating hall, but a picture gallery. Which explains why John writes using such loud and vibrant imagery. He wants his readers, he wants us to reimagine our day-to-day -day lives and the world that we live in. He unveils heavenly and future realities and gives us a new set of symbols, pictures, to frame how we perceive the world and the reality of our lives. And our text for this evening is Revelation chapter 4 and 5, which comes at the beginning of the second great vision that John is given. And it initiates everything that is to follow. And it's in these chapters that we will observe with the Apostle John two great realities about God and his Messiah that we must fix our mind's eye upon so that the eyes of our hearts, our affections, our imaginations would be captivated by the supreme worthiness of God and his Christ. So let's have a look at our text together. And we'll do so under two main headings. And firstly, we will see that all rule and worship belong to God in chapter 4. And then secondly, we'll see that the world and its future have been given to Jesus the Messiah. Two chapters, two headings, but ultimately one message. All rule and worship belong to God. And he has given the world and its future to Jesus the Messiah. So firstly, chapter 4. All rule and worship belong to God. Verse 1. Our passage begins with John seeing a door standing open in heaven. And with a trumpet summons, John is called up into the very throne room of God. Here, he is given a vision by the Lord Jesus Christ of what must soon take place, of what must occur in the last days. And if, like John, you were given a door standing open in heaven, if you were issued a heavenly perspective on reality, the first thing you would see is a throne with one seated on the throne. Look with me at verses 2 to 6. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. A rainbow, resembling an emerald, encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were twenty-four other thrones, and seated on them were twenty-four elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear, uh, clear as crystal. Uh, the vision John sees is bright. Verse 5, there is fire and flashes of lightning 
before the throne. In verse 3, there are these precious stones, and in verse 6, this crystal-like sea, which together collects and intensifies the light around the throne, reflecting the unapproachable brightness. The vision is bright. This vision John sees is also loud. We read in verse 5. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. It's quite the image, isn't it? John catches a glimpse of the glory of God in all his thundering, shining brilliance. Now, this vision that John sees, it appeals to the senses. It is loud and it is bright. And did you notice that it's also very, very high? It is a vision of a throne in the heavens. Like in the prophet Ezekiel's vision, it is a throne surrounded by a bright rainbow of glory, like an emerald, in verse 3. And around the throne is this, is this, sea, of, is this sea of glass which refers to the expanse of the heavens, often called the firmament. Uh, the firmament is the, is the boundary between heaven and earth, established on the second day of creation, uh, described in Genesis 1 and later described in the Old Testament by the prophet Ezekiel as being like a crystal vault above the earth. This throne then, we're meant to get this picture, this throne is above all the world. In verse 4, we see that it is above all other heavenly thrones. Um, perhaps we have uh, 24 elders, perhaps representing um, the, the redeemed people of God in heaven. Uh, 12 from the old covenant people of God and, and 12 from the new, perhaps. But either way, all of these thrones, they're, they're kind of placed around this other throne. Uh, and, and this central throne is, is above them all. And to paraphrase from Tolkien, this throne is the one throne to rule them all. This throne is also seen as being at the very centre of the universe. And we don't quite get the complete picture of this yet, but as, as chapter 4 progresses and as we move through chapter 5, we find that the throne is described as having these kind of... Um, concentric circles of praise and worship radiating and expanding outwards from it so um, the inner circle of the elders and the cherubim and the seraphim from chapter four they initiate the movement of worship they're kind of the inner circle and then the rest of the heavenly host join them thousands and thousands of angels in chapter five verse eleven before them being surrounded and joined by the whole of creation, the whole created order, in chapter 5, verse 13. Until we get this kind of great and glorious picture of the entire cosmos caught up in a chorus of praise and worship to God. And the bullseye, right at the centre, is God's throne. In chapter 4 and 5, we 